Coming up on The Road to Now. The notion of Arnold as a villain is, I don't think, is ever going to change. Who were the people involved uh, in this? And what, what did they think? And what, what was their attitude about it? They ultimately, uh, the bateau started to leak. Uh, a, a, a lot of them didn't make it. And in the middle of all this, there was, it was like a, a hurricane, which was amazing that a hurricane very rarely, right, would a hurricane come to, to the wilderness of Maine, but it did that year. The books I've written have focused on the people that were involved in each of these events. I felt like the people were as, at least as important as the event itself. I'm Bob Crawford. And I'm Ben Sawyer, and this is The Road to Now. And uh, it turns out The Road to Now has taken Bob and I to two different places right now. Bob, where are you at? I'm in Toledo, Ohio at the zoo. I'm sitting in the back of our tour bus uh, in the parking lot of the Toledo Zoo. Wow, tour buses and zoos. What a beautiful life. I am sitting at, uh, at my mother-in-law's place in Long Beach, California. My wife and I have come out here to spend a few weeks. Uh, and we will be meeting up, Bob and I, uh, in Portland on July 20th. But for now, Bob just got through with a run through New Haven and uh, has some great episodes. Why don't you tell us about the episode for today, Bob? Well, that's right, Ben. I was in New Haven, Connecticut, and I visited the New Haven Museum and Historical Society. I met uh, two great guys, the first of which was Stephen Darley. He discovered a, his love and passion for history and took it to the next level. So I got into history, and I, I kind of thought at one point, well, the only way to take this further is to go back to school and become a historian like Ben Sawyer is. <laughs> but Stephen Darley worked his career and in his retirement has written three books about Benedict Arnold. He has done such intensive research on his own and with, with a few partners that he's uncovered new information about Arnold and the men who served with him. Yeah, and I, I think, Bob, this is one of the beautiful things about history is that, I mean, you do have to have a rigorous training and we have to have standards in terms of the documentation we use, but unlike other fields like hard sciences and such as physics, uh, people can participate and you can be driven by passion and you have to learn the rules, but you can contribute greatly to our understanding of history without having the formal degree. And uh, I think this is a great example of that. That's right. Well, Stephen's a great guy and I hope you enjoy our conversation. Stephen Darley. Welcome to The Road to Now. How are you doing today? Good. Thank you for having me. Maybe just start out by uh, telling us a little, little bit about yourself. For almost 40 years, I ran a real estate development and construction company, and I retired in 2009. And sort of then, I've started to really focus on Revolutionary War history, wrote three books about uh, Revolutionary War history, mostly focused on Benedict Arnold's activities. For our listeners' sake, I want to tell everybody that Benedict Arnold is one of those characters of history that has always captivated my imagination. He was a very talented and able and inspiring figure, but he he often did not get the honor that that was due to him, and he he was so hyper conscious of being a, a dist in the parlance of our times, yes. that he became consumed by this. And ultimately now you say Benedict Arnold and that term is synonymous with treachery. Yes. Can you just give us a summary of his early life and how he became a radical and got into the military? He was born in Norwich, Norwich Connecticut uh, in, 19, in 1740. Um, his family was, uh, helped settle Rhode Island. His great-grandfather was the governor of Rhode Island. His grandfather was uh, the speaker of the house in Rhode Island. And by the time it got down to his father, he, he was not the oldest son, so he didn't inherit anything. And he moved to Connecticut, Norwich. Um, and there, uh, Benedict Arnold was born and raised by uh, his father, who was successful for a time, but then became not so successful and turned to alcohol. The father had a, a boat, a, a vessel that he used for trading purposes, but um, I think alcohol sort of 
consumed him and ruined the business in the process. So Benedict Arnold grew up in a family with a very strong mother and a weak father. Um, and uh, some people think that, you know, that influenced how, how he became what he became. Uh, I, I, undoubtedly it did. Uh, anybody who has family knows that family can be have impact on your the, your life, and, and I'm sure it did on him. Um, but his mother was a strong influence in his life too. Um, so hard to tell what how much family it really did influence him, but I'm sure it did. It's somewhat unclear to me how he became uh, as involved in the Patriot cause as he did. Um, there's, there's, you know, there's no record that, that really tells that very much. So, uh, but he was I involved, and in early 1775, he was selected to be the captain of a company in New Haven called the Second Governor's Foot Guard, which is still in existence. Uh, and he was the first captain, as far as we know. Um, and uh, when Lexington and Concord happened, that company went to Boston to, as a responder to Lexington and Concord. So, and, and when he was captain of the company, they trained once or twice a week in, in the New Haven Green. Um, and he had some run-ins with various uh, officials in New Haven. He was a hothead. Yeah, it would appear. Uh, he strongly believed in the Patriot cause. When he went to Boston, uh, he, he had, his trading business, he was the kind of person that was active in it. And so he sailed ships that, and, and that he owned that were trading all over the world. Uh, so he had been to a lot of places. He'd certainly been to Canada. He'd certainly been to Lake Champlain. Um, he 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 had he had been around a lot, and he was familiar with uh, with the world as it, it then existed. He was familiar with the British Empire, and what that meant. Um, he knew about Fort Ticonderoga, where there was some cannons, uh, and it occurred to him that uh, the Americans ought to try to take that fort and get the cannons. So when he got to Boston, he went to the. Uh, the Massachusetts Committee of Safety and proposed that, that they do that and they supported him and made him a colonel. Uh, I'm not sure if they actually had a unit, but he was, he, he achieved the rank of colonel and so he went to Fort Ticonderoga to rec and recruited men on the way and then he and Ethan Allen took the fort together. Um, what was their relationship like? Can you, uh, from, you, how, from, how did they meet, like how did they meet and well they met at uh, out, uh, outside uh, in a small Vermont town Castleton outside of Fort Ticonderoga for the first time they I don't think they got along well um, Ethan Allen uh, also had a big ego um, and he had more men Benedict Arnold probably only had a handful of men because he had people out recruiting uh, at the time, but when he heard about Ethan Allen's Green Mountain Boys planning to take the fort, he went there to, to be part of it. Um, the taking of the fort was, was turned out to be a bigger deal than one would have thought because ultimately the cannons in that fort were used by Washington to get the British out of Boston, um, which no, I don't think anybody would have thought at the time that that, that would be a use of the cannons of Fort Ticonderoga. Um, Benedict Arnold did not have anything to do with that. That was Washington's deal. Henry Knox. Right, get, correct. Uh, getting them, and, and I've read epics, uh, an epic story about them actually getting the cannons back to to Boston. Yes, it was quite, yes. quite a... Yeah. a an event and Knox really did a phenomenal job. Um, so th that that was a one outcome of Benedict Arnold taking the fort. the The other thing that he did at that time is he recognized 
that Lake Champlain was a fairly crucial area. And uh, before Allen and Arnold took the, the fort, Allen sent a group of guys up to the local head man in that area who had a big uh, estate and he had lumber mills, he had uh, other things, and he had a, a, a boat, a, a sailing vessel. Um, they captured that. Um, the, I don't think that Ethan Allen people realized what they had there, but Benedict Arnold did, so he put his own people on it. And then they sailed that up to St. John's, Canada, and captured another boat and there. And, and um, they also got uh, the, the, um, a, a boat that was half finished, and they took all the pieces of that with them. So at that point in time, Benedict Arnold controlled Lake Champlain with two vessels and the British being in Canada and, and not having enough men to really do anything. But he was worried that they might come down, I think a legitimate worry. So Was he working at the behest of the Continental Congress at this point? No. He was working on his own? Yes, it was him. I think it's pretty significant that in 1775, in, you know, in the spring and summer of 1775, the Americans controlled Lake Champlain as a result of his efforts. It's, uh, it's not well recognized, nobody really thinks it was a big deal, but I think it was a big deal because uh, if the British had tried to come down, they, you know, he had two vessels with guns that he could have fought with them, but, but it didn't happen that year, it did happen the next year. But. So uh, one, of the th one of the things that Benedict Arnold, one of the, the reasons that he was, became unhappy with the Patriot cause with well, the first reason is when after he they captured Ticonderoga after he got these vessels uh, and went to St. John's and got the other vessel and came back they then dismissed him uh, from his position. This, now we're looking at we can start this um, this checklist that I'm sure Benedict Arnold had in his head of slights. Yes. Right. And so yes. here's his first. Yes. This is, could we call this the first slight? Yes, in absolutely. History? Okay. In, Wh why? Uh, you'd have to say, to some extent, not surprising, politics. Um, he, he was there through the Massachusetts Committee of Safety. When, when the Continental Congress and all these uh, colonies realized what had been done uh, without their necessarily all of their approval and they, they didn't all necessarily agree that that should have been done at that point in time because they thought it would just provoke the British. Um, and this is the civilian authority. Correct, these correct. There was no really military, I mean there were, there were military people around but there was no, Washington wasn't in charge at that point. Um, so uh, the civilian people decided that Connecticut would be the lead and of course Connecticut didn't recognize Benedict Arnold's position because he was appointed by Massachusetts so they put their own guy and uh, the Massachusetts sent a, a note to Benedict Arnold look they've agreed it's Connecticut it's going to do this so you've got to leave so he did um, not happy um, and you know there there were some disagreements with people uh, over that, um, and in fact, in that circumstance, he made uh, a few enemies that haunted him for a long time. They a year later brought charges against him, accusing him of various things, which he had to defend himself in a court martial. Um, so that was, I would say, slight number two, the court martial that he he had to undergo in 1776. Um, in in the meantime, uh, he went to Washington. Washington took over in July of 75, and Arnold was at his headquarters outside of Boston. And depending on whose story you believe, uh, at some point, somebody convinced Washington that they, they should take Canada, and Washington came up, or somebody came up, uh, it's not clear who, with the idea of having a two-prong attack on Canada, one up the Lake Champlain, uh, up the Richelieu River to, uh, 
and, and uh, that would be one attack mode, and then they would have another going through um, the wilderness of Maine and up to Quebec. Uh, Washington picked Arnold to head that group. Did Arnold kind of push for that? Position? I think he did, but there again, there's no evidence of that, but I think he must have, and my first book was about that, uh, and I identified... Uh, so what's the name of the book? The name of the book is Voices from a Wilderness Expedition, uh, the Benedict Arnold uh, Invasion of Canada in 1775. And you look at the men's journals? Correct. One interesting thing about that expedition um, is it, there's a total of uh, 30 journals that were written by participants in that expedition, which is astonishing, really, uh, because the, the number of people that were on it w was, I think I identified 1,200 people, roughly, that, that were on that expedition. So out of that, there were 30 journals. There's not another event in the Revolutionary War that had that many journals written. It's just stunning to me. What, what are the consistent uh, threads that you see through each journal? Is, are there some consistencies with the people's individual interpretations of what was happening? Yeah, I would say, uh, although, you know, everybody had a different perspective, not surprising, because they, they wrote about what they saw. Of course. And uh, it, the expedition was divided up so that there was a, a lead group and a middle group and a back group. And most of the people who wrote journals were, were in the, the first two groups. There was only one journal in the, the last group. That was the group that ultimately returned, taking a third, basically, of the, of the people with them. Um, so he started off with, say, 1,200, and by the time they got to Canada, they had about 600. Between people dying in the wilderness and this group leaving. Um, but uh, I found these journals fascinating, and at the time I wrote my book, uh, there was one anonymous journal, and then subsequent to the book, I, at, when I wrote the book, I couldn't identify who that was, but then I, a, a friend of mine and I did, and he did most of the research, really. We did identify who the author was and published that in an article. So, um, and I uncovered, um, in um, Scotland, the original journal of Henry Dearborn, which the Massachusetts Historical Society had published a version of his journal, but it was written later. This was the original journal that had been in, in uh, Scotland since 1779, I think. Um, so the, I thought, you know, I really uh, enjoyed that research of, of finding out all, all these journals and who wrote them. And now, now we know who wrote every journal. Uh, and I've looked at mo the, whatever journals were uh, original, uh, where the original is still available, I've looked at, at, at that original. Amazing. So. Amazing. Amazing. So, so let's talk about this expedition and how, the, how it ultimately went. Well, they left from Boston. They sailed uh, up the Atlantic to, uh, into Maine and, and uh, then up the Kennebec River of Maine up to Fort Western. And there they were supposed to get 200 bateaus. Uh, which had been made especially for this expedition. When they got there, they did find 200 bateaus, but they were ma mostly made out of green wood. They didn't uh, work too well, but, of course, at that point, he had no choice. Right, so whose fault was that? Good question. I mean, the rea reality is, according to people who are boat builders, that there's no way in the time allowed that they could have built decent bateaus. It couldn't have been done, uh, not that many. So it's not surprising, you know, that, uh, that when they got there, they had bateaus made of green wood. I mean, that, that's what you would expect. And they were already ill-equipped. Correct. And, and in just in a terrible mood. Correct. And, the, and um, 
from there, from Fort Western, they went by, by bateaus in uh, three or four groups and started up the Kennebec River, and then they had to take the bateaus uh, across to, uh, some land to another river. And um, they ultimately, uh, the bateaus started to leak. Uh, 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 I, a lot of them uh, didn't, didn't make it uh, because they were too leaky, and uh, and in the middle of all this, there was it was like a a hurricane, which was amazing that a hurricane. They're very rarely right would a hurricane come to to the wilderness of Maine, but it did that year. And then it started to snow. When it started to snow was when the last group who left decided we've had it. We're not doing this. This is crazy. We're all going to be killed. So we're leaving. So 350 of them, basically, uh, under uh, the, the command of a colonel named Roger Enos, left. Um, and uh, that was a big blow, you know, because they, then they were left with a lot fewer people. When they got to Quebec, finally, uh, they didn't have really enough. They had to wait for the other prong of the attack. And that was led by... General Richard Montgomery. Unfortunately, in the attack on Quebec, he was killed. I think he would have made a good American officer, uh, but he didn't last very long. But he got a lot of publicity, um, more than, in, well, I'd say Arnold got his share of publicity, too. That, that's when Arnold first came to people's attention, I think, after this, even though the, the attack on Quebec failed. But uh, Arnold's effort to go, take all these men through the Maine wilderness with what they suffered and uh, his leadership on the attack even though he got shot in the leg um, again we can mark this down as like the, his first wound yes correct which would this would all play into his ultimate um, treason correct the attack on Quebec was ill-fated from the start correct and ended that way correct there was there was never enough money. Uh, they didn't have. They had like two cannons that Montgomery brought up with them, or something like that. Not many cannons. Not enough cannons to 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 attack a, a fortress like Quebec was. Uh, they didn't have any supplies. They didn't really have enough men. Um, the Con Continental Congress. Uh, Initially, was totally unsympathetic, but as pressure was brought to bear, they sent a group up to Canada to see what was going on. Um, and one of those that went up there was Benjamin Franklin, even though he was pretty old. And I would think that was probably a difficult trip for him to, to, yeah. to get up there. Um, and uh, they recommended that unless the Continental Congress were prepared to spend a lot of money and, you know, that, that they just call all these troops back from Canada because there was nothing they could, they couldn't achieve anything. So when Arnold returned, where, he must have been sore. He was sore. Yes. And w what was next for him? Uh, when he returned, uh, when he left... Philip Schuyler was uh, in charge of the Northern Army. Washington had made him the commander of the Northern Army. Um, by the time they got back from Canada, uh, Horatio Gates had replaced Schuyler as the commander of the Northern Army. So when Arnold got back, Gates was in command, not Schuyler. Arnold was close to Schuyler, they, probably because they were both fairly wealthy and traders, uh, not, not traders in, in the sense of trading, <laughs> not, um, they, they had a lot in common and they were good friends. Um, he did not have the same relation. I don't know that he even knew Gates when he came back. Can you give us just a little bit of a, a view of Gates as a man? Uh, well, Gates is a controversial guy. You know, the, the historians disagree about him. There are some who think he was really a good general, and there were there are more actually who think he was lousy, uh, and that it was a big mistake to put him in charge of anything. Um, a lot of that, I think, comes from the fact that he did try to undercut Washington a lot, and 
he was trying to get himself as a replacement for Washington. Um, uh, a lot is made of the fact that some people referred to him as Granny Gates because they thought he was an old guy that uh, that, that couldn't uh, do the job. Um, I don't know. I mean, I have some sympathy with Gates, uh, but he. Uh, one thing he did do is he recognized when he came to command the, the Northern Army in the, in the spring of '76, he realized they have a lake. You know, the, they also had the intelligence that the British had just got a reinforcement of about 12,000 troops from England. Um, so he knew that the British were going to come down because the Americans had failed in their attempt. And what would be more natural for the British now with 12,000 new recruits to come down Lake Champlain and try to, you know, take the northern part of the, uh, of the colonies. And so I think he realized when he looked around at who he had up there that Arnold was the one with the experience uh, in, you know, d dealing with, uh, with vessels. And Arnold had a reputation of being a fighter at that point, which was deserved. And so they put Arnold in charge of this fleet of vessels on Lake Champlain to try to stop whatever the British were going to do in 1776. Arnold ended, ended up commanding 16 vessels. One was still on, being constructed when the Battle of Alcor Island was, was fought. He, he was in control of these 16 vessels. Interestingly, Gates knew that this was a very iffy proposition, so he tried to keep as much distance as he could from him personally. Again, politics, that. right? Yes. Politics, politics, yes. politics. Yes, exactly. Politics, politics, politics. So, but Arnold didn't care. He was happy to be in command, uh, and you know, he felt like he could uh, present some good opposition to the British, and in fact, he did. He found probably the only place on Lake Champlain where he had a, even a, a fighting chance to, to deal with the British. Um, and he stationed his fleet there, which was between Valcor Island and the New York mainland. Um, and so when the British fleet sailed down, they, had to, they went down past um, Valcor Island. They didn't see the American uh, vessels that were anchored between the island and the mainland until they got way down. Then they had to sail up. Fortunately for the Americans, the wind was coming from north to south, so they were sailing up in the wind. Um, that was a genius thing, I think. I don't know that the, there would be anybody other than Arnold that would have selected that spot and been able to plan out what they would do. Um, so the British and the Americans had a, a, a battle uh, there. and Which you also wrote a book about. Correct. It's called The Battle of Valcor Island. Um, one of the things I did in that book, by the way, is for some reason, in all these years, no one had ever tried to identify who the captains of all these vessels were, which is, was amazing to me. Uh, so I did that, and I got uh, all but one uh, commander uh, and, and ver you know, verification of, from various sources that, that, that they, in fact, were the the captains of the vessels. Uh, so I feel good about that. I don't think many people don't seem to care, but to me it was a big deal. Let's talk about you for a minute, because a lot of this show is connecting the present to the past and seeing how personal narratives kind of weave in with the larger historical narrative. So what you served in Vietnam. Right. Correct. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And how do you think that affects uh, your historical work? That's a good question. No one's ever asked me that. Uh, I've never really thought about it. That's a very good question. Um, it probably had some impact, I would think, uh, but it, it, it's it's not something that's you know that I'm aware of. It's it's not a, an effect that I'm aware of. So I don't know how much effect that really had. Um, 
I got into Arnold because I read uh, two novels by Kenneth Roberts that are pretty well-known novels, and, and after I read them, I said, could, could he have this right? Could this be, Benedict Arnold be that different than what we've all been taught, what I thought I knew about Benedict Arnold? And I was interested enough that I started to really get in to looking at Arnold, and then, you know, one thing led to another, and it became a, a really big interest. And the books I've written have focused on the people that were involved in each of these events. Uh, so I felt like the people were as, at least as important as the event itself and what their perspectives was, which is why I tried to identify in each book the people who were involved in that event the Amer on the American side. Um, and it took a lot of research uh, to do that. I've read... Uh, I, uh, probably o over the course of time, about 4,000 uh, pension applications uh, to, to find out who were the people involved uh, in this and what, what did they think, what, what was their attitude about it. So, We are all active participants in history. We don't realize it. When history really happens, it's it's due to practical necessity no question and 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 events reaction to events that that occur how did valcor island end up for arnold and his men after the first day um the americans had been hit pretty hard and when the day ended the british were south of the of the american line of vessels um between valcor island and the mainland so at night, the British had this row of, uh, of their vessels, thinking that they, there's no way they had the Americans trapped, so the next day they were gonna wipe them out, no problem. Uh, but Arnold called a, a, a meeting of all his officers, and they decided on a strategy to come around the edge of the, the British line of vessels with their vessels, uh, and escape, and they did that. So the next morning when the British woke up, instead of seeing American vessels there, there was nothing. I can't even imagine what that would have been like for the first guy who opened their eyes, got up, looked out there, and said, hey, there, there's no vessels here. What happened? Uh, that, that, would, that seems to me to be a pretty amazing uh, action uh, th that they did. I mean, it wasn't just Arnold. It was his idea, but it, they all did it. It was amazing what they did. But then, of course, they got caught in Lake Champlain by the British the next day and mostly destroyed, and Arnold finally had to run his ships aground, blow them up, and, uh, and get back to Fort Ticonderoga. It, it was a success, though, in, in the sense that they stopped the British from going any further that year. Let's go, let's go to Saratoga. Okay, so here now we, we have Gates and Arnold together. Can you set this battle up for us? Because it, it seems very significant. Arnold, after uh, the Lake Champlain battle, uh, he, he, um, he, got, he got both criticism and salutes for his actions. Um, there, there was a lot of criticism uh, that you know, he destroyed the American fleet. There was no reason why they should do that. They should have just stayed around Fort Ticonderoga and not tried to stop the British. Um, uh, I think that that's n not a accurate uh, assessment of, of that battle. But anyway, Arnold w was helpful with others in selecting the the site where they would oppose the British coming down the next year in the summer of 1777, which is where the Battle of Saratoga, when it occurred and why it occurred. Um, so John Burgoyne, the British general, came down from Canada with a sizable number of troops and um, the, the Americans at least were were cagey enough to figure out a place that they could maybe have some effect in stopping this British advance. Um, and Arnold at the time was one of the division commanders under Gates. 
Um, and uh, before the Battle of Saratoga occurred, um, the, the, the British had engaged in a three-prong approach, supposedly three-prong approach. Burgoyne coming down, um, the, the uh, Lake Champlain down to Fort Ticonderoga and then going down and the idea was, would be he would go to New York. Um, Howe, General Howe from Philadelphia was supposed to come up and meet him. That was the, the second prong. And then the third prong was um, coming down sort of in, uh, on the, uh, the eastern side of Lake Champlain um, to, to Fort Stanwix uh, and then take Fort Stanwix uh, and that would help Burgoyne's effort. Well, the, the British, that British uh, prong came down to Fort Stanwix and sort of got stuck, but Fort Stanwix was slowly getting starved out. They needed someone to go rescue him. Uh, Gates called a, a meeting of all his officers. No one would volunteer. They could all see it was a loser. That they, 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 and Arnold finally volunteered to go, which he did, and he got the, the British and Indians that were surrounding the fort to leave. So at that point, he was in feeling pretty good, I think, that you know, he, would, he would be okay. But then when he came back, him and Gates got into a lot of disputes, and uh, Gates finally relieved Arnold of his command, which would be point number whatever. <laughs> yeah. that, that, slight. Uh, slight, yes. Um, but Arnold being Arnold, uh, he was still around camp, and at some point, he, on his own, he decided he was going to get involved in the battle and uh, rode his horse out into the battlefield and found some guys that knew him from Connecticut, I think they were. Um, and he led an attack on one of the redoubts, and they were successful. And, uh, Burgoyne's army ultimately got defeated. They took a lot of prisoners, and uh, as you know, that was uh, the incentive for the French to come in the war. And he was Arnold was wounded, Arnold was wounded. again, right? Yes. Wounded again. Same leg. Same leg. Same leg. Yes. Uh, and this wound was pretty bad. They, apparently, uh, the doctors that were treating him wanted to amputate his leg, but he refused to to let that happen. But he was a long time in recovering. Um, so um, the the battle, and Arnold got no credit for anything that happened in that battle, which I think is, uh, is another slight. Yeah. Uh, Gates tried to take pretty much all the credit himself. Did, did Ga I read one time an account that Gates kind of hid in his tent. That's, there is, there is an account that says that. Yes, there is an account that says that. That Gates was in his tent talking to one of uh, Burgoyne's officers, I forget which one, uh, who he knew, because he was in the British Army, obviously Gates was, in the French and Indian War. So this was someone he knew, and they were having a conversation about... Surrender. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Gates was not on the battlefield, that's for sure. So Arnold uh, convalesces, and, and in this time, the British leave Philadelphia. He, Correct. He gets Washington, who had an affinity for Arnold. Correct. Uh, gives him command of Philadelphia. Right. Worst decision Arnold ever made to say yes to that. Right. He was, and, and he goes to Philadelphia, and he meets Peggy Shippen. Correct. Falls in love. Correct. She has a relationship with a British soldier, British commander named John Andre. I think the relationship between Peggy Shippen and, and John Andre is way over emphasized. Uh, they did know each other. Were they girlfriend, boyfriend? I seriously doubt that. Uh, there's, there, I think there's absolutely no evidence of that, but people find evidence in what they want to find. I mean, there, there was a diary of one of her friends who, who talked about her and Andre having a, a, a relationship. So there is that. Um, but um, 
I think Andre was a, was a decent guy and a, and a good officer and was recognized as such by his commanders and ultimately he was appointed head of the British Secret Service under Henry Clinton when Arnold made his fateful decision to change. The, the Shippen family were loyalists? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I think a lot is made of that. Everybody who writes about Peggy Shippen says she was a loyalist. Uh, it strikes me as somewhat I, unlikely because her father ended up being uh, Chief Justice of the, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court in the 1790s. doesn't strike me that that would have happened if he was a clear loyalist. I think it, it, this is what I really think. The definition of loyalist in Philadelphia at that time, given who was in charge, was is if you didn't vociferously support the Patriots, you were a loyalist. And the Shippen family didn't vociferously support. They didn't support the British, but they didn't support the Patriots. Therefore, in the Patriots' mind, they were loyalists. So again, you have a family who is a well-to-do family in Correct. Philadelphia, surviving the lifestyle that they are used to and that they're comfortable in, uh, go along to get along. Correct. Now, there were Shippens who were in the American Army, so um, not, not, uh, not the immediate family of Peggy Shippen, but her cousin uh, and her uncle was a Surgeon General or the equivalent of Surgeon General at the, at the time. So uh, it, it would, it's hard to make a, a, a realistic argument, I think, that the Shippens were loyalists um, based on the record. But people say that, and that's pretty much what everybody believes, is that Peggy Shippen was a loyalist, and Benedict Arnold favored the loyalists over the Patriots in Philadelphia, which I don't think is really true. I mean, he, he was friendly with loyalists, he was friendly with Patriots. Um, one thing he did was uh, the, the Patriot government w decided to hang two guys that, that were, they considered uh, traitors. Um, one, one of them that I'm aware of, the most that he had done is sort of acted as a, a guide for the British Army when they came into Philadelphia. I mean, I guess that's, you know, it's, it's not so good from the Patriot side, but did, it, did he deserve to be hanged for that? I don't know. But anyway, Arnold opposed the hanging of these two guys, and that really made the Patriots in Philadelphia not happy at all. So, but I think that was a, a, a very reasoned position and a, a, and a position that Arnold didn't have to take. He could have just gone along with it, but he didn't. So what ultimately fostered the relationship between him, he and Andre? Because how did he turn? How did he turn to the British side? Well, as you probably know, the the, the Philadelphia Patriot government brought eight charges against Arnold, um, and uh, initially, when it was investigated, uh, they threw out all the charges, and the Patriot government went ballistic and said, no, you can't do that, or we're going to withdraw, for, or we're not going to provide any man or money to the cause anymore if you do that. So they went back again and came up with two uh, of the charges that they were going to have a court-martial on. So w explain these charges for our listeners. One of them was, one of the charges was that when, the, when Arnold came to Philadelphia, they, they put a, a hold on any tra any trading activity uh, so people couldn't go in a store and buy for a period of time. They put a hold on all of that. But the, the, the assertion was that Arnold um, took the goods out of the stores and sold them himself. Uh, there is some evidence to support that. I, I don't doubt that, that something like that pro probably happened. Um, I, but, you know, he wouldn't have been the only person that was doing things like that, uh, unfortunately. Um, so that was one of the charges. Another charge 
was that he issued a pass to a, a loyalist lady who was a friend of Peggy Shippen's. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, another, another charge was that he used uh, military wagons to take supplies off of a, a vessel that he had an interest in and bring him into Philadelphia to get him out of the way of the British Navy. Uh, so th th there, were, there were eight charges, sort of things like that, uh, where Arnold supposedly personally benefited or did things that w were not, not, were undercutting the Patriot effort. And um, so he did, he did uh, go through a, a court martial. To him, a slight. Total slight. To him, a yes. total slight. And the, the interesting thing is that he was then in the process of trying to figure out how he could leave the army, uh, and he wanted to get some land in upstate New York and just go there and settle and forget the, the, the politics of the army and what was going on, which at that point, things weren't going very well, actually, for the, the American side. Um, so a lot of people were discouraged, I, I think, uh, over the status of things. Uh, there was no real advance anywhere. It was sort of like, um, you know, the war in Afghanistan, you could say, where th things would happen and they would make a move and then the British would make a counter move and it never really it got, got anywhere. Um, I mean, that was the situation at the, in, in 1780 when Arnold changed sides. Um, he had just gone through a court martial, uh, and he had been convicted of two of the charges. And Washington issued a, a re rebuke to him, a pub public rebuke. Um, and uh, Washington was still sympathetic w with him, though. Um, well, it's it's interesting. After the court martial charges were dropped, Washington sort of cooled, and whenever Arnold tried to approach him, he didn't get much. And I think he felt like Washington had had, had uh, his whatever friendship they had was gone, and Washington was treating this uh, as a. a the, any what a, a normal case that would come before him and try to be objective and so Arnold thought he should be more supportive and he wasn't uh, although his the the rebuke that he issued was not that bad but still it was you know publicized he he wrote it out and that was another slight to Arnold. I think that's pretty much tipped the... The final straw. Yeah. So then what was Washington's thinking in appointing Arnold to West Point? Well, I think I think Washington still felt like Arnold was a, a, a good commander. I mean, it's not like he had... Washington didn't have a, a huge number of officers who were competent. Um, most of them were trying to... Not most. Some of them were trying to take his job. Some of them uh, were total incompetence. Um, so it's not like he had a huge number of choices um, of, of people that could that he could, had any confidence could he could uh, you know there were a handful maybe um, Nathaniel Green would be one that he trusted and liked um, uh, Knox was another although Knox never really was in combat much uh, but. You know, there weren't many combat officers that he could assign to some place and have some confidence that, that, that things would be done right. I mean, one thing you can say about Arnold, when he took a job, he tried to do it. Um, so uh, even though I think things cooled between Washington and Arnold, uh, Washington still recognized that he had abilities in, in, in a way that most of his other officers didn't. So. so Let's talk about the actual act of treason, the final act of treason. He was trying to hand over the fort, West Point, to the British? Correct. And Washington was coming to visit? Correct. Can you set that up for us? Washington had been um, to, to, I think, in, to, to Connecticut to meet with uh, the French 
officer in charge of the French army that had been assigned to America. Uh, and um, he passed through West Point on his way, talked to Arnold, and then went to Connecticut uh, to, to meet with the, the French general. And um, then he was going to come back to West Point, and he told Arnold, I'll be back to West Point. Uh, I'll see you when I get, get, get through with this meeting. Um, Arnold, in the meantime, had surveyed the, the fortifications at West Point. He knew that they were not in very good shape, that there were, was a lot that needed to be done. Um, and in the process of surveying the fort, obviously, he could see where the weaknesses are, and he gave that information to, to Andre indirectly. I don't think it was Arnold's intent to have the British capture Washington, but I don't know. That, that, hard, to, hard to tell. There's no direct evidence of that, but then the way things turned out, it sort of looks like that probably might have, have been part of his intention. But there's no, there's no real evidence to back that up that I've ever seen. Um, but uh, regardless of that, um, it was Arnold's intention to turn West Point over to the British. Um, Arnold was in communication with Andre, who was the chief of the British spy system at that point. And uh, Clinton and Andre wanted to make sure they were really dealing with Arnold, I think. And so they sent, he, uh, Clinton sent Andre up uh, to have a meeting with Arnold to make sure that they weren't being led down the primrose path, <laughs> which would, would be a smart thing to do because they could have been set up totally. Um, and uh, th things did not go well uh, at that point. And um, when Andre got there, he came by uh, a ship up uh, the Hudson River that ship was ultimately fired on and had to go back down and Andre was sort of left with no vessel to return on so Arnold sent him off on a horse with uh, fake IDs and, and, and a, not as a, in his British uniform but in a, a normal civilian clothes um, and he got captured and Ultimately, the papers that he had with him, which sort of led back to Arnold, without a doubt. Uh, and fortunate, fortunately for Arnold, somebody uh, alerted him that that the British, uh, that that, that uh, Andre had been captured. And as soon as he knew that, he knew he was done. So then he rode on his horse down to the river, or the Hudson River, got some guys to take him out by boat to the British vessel, and he escaped. I'm sure uh, it was a difficult time for him, and it was a difficult time for his wife, I think, too. After, uh, when they realized that uh, Arnold was complicit in the, this deal with Andre, uh, they went to West Point and that hope, hoping to capture him, but he had already gone, but his wife was there. And so they talked to the wife and Washington did and Hamilton did. And she uh, put on a good act, if that's what it was. Uh, you know, Hamilton believed her, uh, some other people didn't. So uh, I don't know. Um, Personally, I don't think she was involved. I think he did it all on his own, but there are a lot of people think, who think different. Uh, but the only evidence that, that has her complicit in what he did is a statement by Clinton in the, the, the 1790s, I think, where he said Pe Peggy Shippen was, Arnold was, uh, uh, got well paid for her services, whatever, he did not specify what those services were, but that's what people hang their hat on uh, as to her involvement. And uh, Arnold lived out his days in infamy. Correct, in England. In England. Correct. Well, for, he did go to Canada for a while, but yeah, he died in England. And, and, a, and a spy and a traitor can never truly be trusted by anyone Correct. from that point So on. he never got a, any big position in the British Army. 
hard to know what was represented to him by Clinton and Andre uh, about that. Um, and whatever they represented, they couldn't have delivered anyway, because right, the political structure in Britain was the one that was going to decide whether he got a, a military position, which he didn't. So yeah, I think you're right. They, nobody's going to trust uh, a guy who changed sides. Um, and in an America, in popular culture and in history, he's remembered as a traitor. Totally. Is there, so for all the research you've done on this man, is there another way we should think of him? For, for three years, from 75 to 77, he was amazing, I think, what he did. Um, every, everything he was involved in, he did uh, an, an amazing job. Uh, not at all was successful, but his part was beyond reproach. After that, it, things went downhill for him and really for the Patriot cause. I have a harder time seeing Arnold as the villain that, that other people do. I mean, he's a hero of mine, so I, have, I can't really see him as the villain. Uh, the, the museum here had a series a few years ago called Heroes or Villains, and I spoke at that, and I said, I don't think Arnold's either. You know, he's not a hero because he, he did go to the British, but he's not a villain in my view. But most, some people didn't agree with it and there were comments after my speech that uh, people questioned whether he wasn't a villain. So that's, the, that, that's not gonna change the, the notion of Arnold as a villain is, I don't think is ever gonna change. I think it's great that you've done all this work on him. He's always been an intriguing character to me. Because I, I, you know, I've read about his his heroism, which in the Battle of Saratoga. I mean, right there, it just it turned the tide of the war. Right. There's right. just no doubt we would not have won the war without that event. No and, question. And and a man who was benched, he was put on the bench, and and he he couldn't be stopped. So, thank you so much for being here today. I've really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Can you tell our listeners how they can get your books? Uh, my books are on Amazon.com. Um, I have a, a website at, at DarleyBooks.com. Uh, but all my books are on Amazon. Um, Which is where I, I downloaded them. Yeah. Uh, you can get them uh, for your Kindle. Correct. They're, it's, they're on Kindle, and they're, they're also... Uh, paperbacks and interestingly enough most of the people who go uh, contact me on my website uh, other than you are people who have questions about whether their ancestor was in one of these battles that's that's what people are right. really into you do a lot of genealogy work yes now. amazing well th thank you again Stephen, for being here we really appreciate it thank you well thank you for joining us on the road to now please be sure and find us on facebook Follow us on Twitter at road underscore two underscore now or visit our website, theroadtonow.com. And thank you so much for all the great comments and the ratings on iTunes. That really helps to get the word out about the show. We really appreciate it. Until next time, for Dr. Ben Sawyer, this is Bob Crawford. Take care. <laughs>